I told you stories to give you wings, Rami, so that you would never be trapped by anything. Your name, your title, the limits of your body, this world's suffering. I am telling you this now, this story, for it is a story so that you will live. When I lie buried beneath this earth, you will fly. For me, Rami, for your papa, you will soar. That's Vade Ratner, reading from her novel In the Shadow of the Banyan, which is a 2016 Big Read selection. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Rami is only seven when the Khmer Rouge comes to power in Cambodia. Descended from Cambodian royalty and living a life of privilege, Rami and her family are sent to the countryside, along with hundreds of thousands of Cambodians, for re-education and farm labor. Any hint of Western education was suspect, and intellectuals were routinely murdered. By the time the four-year reign of the Khmer Rouge came to an end, Rami's family, except for herself and her mother, were all dead. It's a grim story, yet it's also filled with moments of beauty, descriptions of landscapes so vivid you can almost smell the blossoms. And the narrative itself is peppered with stories and poems, a legacy of Rami's father, which becomes a source of strength and hope for the little girl. In the Shadow of the Banyan is a novel, but it closely mirrors Vidé Ratner's life and experiences as a child in Cambodia. While the trend recently seems to be fiction masquerading as memoir, Vidé had no interest in chronicling her own life. Although the novel is deeply autobiographical, Vidé Ratner wanted to portray more than one girl's struggle to survive under the Khmer Rouge. I didn't want to write it as a memoir because right away I felt that if someone picking it up, it could be mistaken for the story of my life. And the last thing I wanted was to have the focus on me. And yet the experience was so intensely, so profoundly personal that I couldn't write it in any other voice except in the first person. I think my first and foremost goal was to honor the lives lost, those who made the profound monumental sacrifices to save me as a child. And I want the focus to be on them, on the experience, on the country that I loved. And I didn't want the book to be lost in the discussion well, how much of it is true? Can a narrator this young remember these things, which is often part of the discourse when you talk about a memoir? And I had a story that I wanted to tell, and the story was not so much about what happened to one country, what happened to one family. What I wanted to tell was a story that it was much more universal, uh, a story about our desire for life even in the face of death. And I really wanted to honor that desire along with the people because I saw firsthand in my family how much they wanted to live and how much they fought to live. And you don't know why you survive and why others die. Even now, I can't really answer that question. So when I wrote this book, I wanted to honor the humanity, the love, the beauty that endure. I read In the Shadow of the Banyan. It's a painful book to read, and it had to have been a painful book to write. Can you tell me what went into the decision to write In the Shadow of the Banyan? Well, I think uh, it began very early when I was a young child after so many of my family members were taken away or gone missing. I would rehearse this imagined conversation that I would have with neighbors or people we had known before the Khmer Rouge came in to try to explain what happened to the rest of my family, why I, the one with a physical handicap and seemingly less resilient, 
should still be alive, should still be around. And so for me, the, the story existed in that form first, trying to find expression to justify my survival mm -hmm. while most of my family was gone. Right, it's explaining the inexplicable. Exactly. And, you know, writing it wasn't just remembering the experience for me. It was re reliving it all over again. There were days in which I had to crawl into bed and be completely silent and shut the windows and doors and just in the dark, both as a way to to console myself and also to to imagine the silence, to access the silence that I felt was synonymous with death. You know, I wanted to be closer to those who were gone. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened when I started writing this book, was that I was establishing, again, a conscious connection with the dead. I was exhuming them. I was invoking them. I think writing it in the English language was a consolation. It gave me a little bit of distance. And because English is not my native tongue, I put so much energy into crafting the story. And so a lot of my effort was, was in the beginning focused on that. Rami and her parents, as we said, are modeled on you and your family. Your father was a prince. Yes, he was. Was he also a poet, the way Rami's father was? No, but uh, he was not, an, I guess, an official poet <laughs> in the sense of uh, he was not uh, a published writer or poet. But I think he had the spirit of, of a poet. He was, in actuality, a pilot, a former pilot. But when I was born and was struck with polio, he gave up that life. He became literally grounded <laughs> uh, to take care of me. I think in uh, my mother was uh, was a lot younger than he was, and it was really hard to have her firstborn be struck with this illness. And so my father took up the responsibility of uh, taking care of the sick child. And he would tell me stories. He would recite poetry to me. And when he couldn't explain things to me, he would quote passages from these epic poems like the Ramayana, as if that would just explain what he couldn't explain. Mm -hmm. So I think had he been born into a family, into a culture where he was more free to choose what he wanted to do, I think he would have been a poet instead of a pilot. But instead, he was a storyteller. Yes. Well, storytelling itself seems so central to yes. this book and this story, and the ability of stories to explain life, to transcend moments of horrible suffering, to look up and see the moon. Yes. And that's something Rami learns from her father, and I'm assuming you learned from yours as well. Yes, exactly. When I was growing up, books, whatever litter we had in Cambodia, books were part of my milieu. And stories and storytelling were so central to my existence. Stories felt as real, as alive to me as life itself. We didn't speak of, of fiction or nonfiction stories. Stories are just a reiteration of life, really. And I really wanted Rami to embody that kind of upbringing in her, where her relationship to not only to people but to the natural world, to her entire surroundings, are very story-based. They sustain her. They sustain her, yes. They sustained her and they sustained me as a child. In an experience where you are sent off to work, often time alone, into the forests, and you know you have nothing except your own voice, uh, the the conversations that you have with yourself, with the spirit world, and as a child, both in Rami and in myself, the stories kept us from being scared, from being frightened, from feeling 
that we were alone in this world. It felt to me yes. that it also gave her a sense of a bigger place than the place that she was in at that moment. You yes. know, that whatever circumstance she was in, yes. those stories gave her a sense of a universe that was so much bigger mm. that she could access. Yes, definitely, definitely. It's not only a big universe, the one that you can see, but a world that you couldn't like see. Like the world behind the world. Uh, yes, the world behind the world. And this was very important for her survival because when most family members are gone, she had she has to believe that they've gone somewhere, somewhere where they are safer, they are not starving, that they are not being harmed. In another sense, it gives her an escape, a momentary escape, a secret world where she feels that harm can't reach her. Your father gave you stories and that sustained you. Your mother made sure that you survived. Yes. And it felt to me that the book was such a celebration of both of them, such different people. Yes. Can you describe your mother, please? Well, you know, it, it's hard because she's still alive, and I have my memories of her, and I have the real person now in front of me. And the real person has been so changed by the suffering, the ordeals that she had gone through, and the struggle she continues to face as an immigrant in this country. But my mother, as I remember her when I was that little child at home, was this beautiful, fragile thing. She was, as I describe, Rami's mom in the book, like a butterfly, like this beautiful a being half spirit, half human. Then after my father was gone, I saw how she was transformed. And... I didn't know where her strength came from, but there it was in its full manifestation. And I clung to that strength, even though at the time it felt a little bit hard-edged to me. But I knew that she loved me very much and that more than anything else, she shared my father's fierce desire for me to live even though she didn't have always the gentlest words to express her love. And that's what I try to capture in, in Rami's mother as well. In the beginning of the book, I, I tried to bring out more kind of the fragility, the beauty of who she was. But when the opportunity for me to show her strength, it was just as easy because... Her strength was so visible to me, so palpable. You know, when you think about circumstances like Cambodia, and it's like the Holocaust. I mean, now we have the hindsight of history, and yes. we know, all right, it's four years, and you know, if I could get through these four years, if I could get through these four years, but when you're living through it, you have no idea no. how long this is going to go no. on for, which makes it so much more difficult because you just don't know what the end point's going to be. Yes, that's right. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, I had a similar conversation with my mother recently. And in the Cambodian language, there's no past tense and present tense, you know. Everything is one experience. Time is circular and so forth. But she said th that she knew or she knows, you know, it's hard to tell in the Cambodian language, that it would come to an end. She said that she had to remind herself that, Nothing like this, this horrible suffering, can't last forever. That if such terribleness, such horror, has the power to be permanent, then we wouldn't have what we call the human community. The very fact that we exist, we as human beings exist as a community, speaks to the endurance of humanity. And, you know, and it's curious for me to hear her s say that. The English-speaking side of me wanted to really press her. Did you feel that way in that moment? But, you know, when you live through something like that, 
You don't have such a, f a forward way of looking at things. You're just trying to survive from one moment to the next. When you're enduring this level of suffering, if you can focus on what it takes for another breath, what it takes to move to the next minute, I think that is the very definition of strength. That is the very definition of your faith in life that instead of just giving up, you're fighting. You're fighting with every breath just to take another step. Rami's mother urges her to remember who she is until she doesn't. Rami's mother shifted from you're your father's daughter, you come from the royal family, and then she said, no, I'm wrong. You are the daughter of a servant. You mm -hmm. are exactly who you are now. That seems like such a pivotal moment in that book. Yes. What was happening then? What was going on? I think in the beginning, Rami's mother wants her to remember her core, who she is. And she believes that it is this core, knowing your worth, will be your strength. But then they arrive at a point in their experience where the talk of inner strength, the talk of this emotional life <laughs> is no longer relevant. People are dying left and right, and they are being taken away at night, murdered. This is a completely foreign world, and it's more than that. It, it's like an alternate existence in which Rami's mother doesn't understand how to be a mother in, in the sense of protecting her child. And so her main concern now becomes, I want you to do whatever it takes to live, even if you have to lie, even if you have to forget who you are, even if you have to steal, even if you have to forget me, forget yourself, just live. I think that's the transformation. In the book, there are many losses. I'd like to talk about two. Rami's father in order to save his family, admits that he is of royal stock, which means that he's taken away by the Khmer Rouge. And then there's Rami's sister, whose death we see. We know that she's dead. But with her father, we can infer that he's dead, but we don't know what's happened. And that becomes its own kind of hell, even more crazy-making, I would think. Oh, yes. You know, a sad as that death of uh, the sister was. And I can still access the sorrow, the grief. I can also access that feeling of consolation when I told myself, and that, that experience was transferred uh, to Rami, that at least she's no longer suffering, the sister. The child is no longer suffering, and that she's going to a place where no one can harm her. And there's somehow an end, a definitive end to their suffering. With Rami's father and my own father, it's, it's hard. Throughout the novel, Rami continues to feel her father's presence everywhere. She sees him in everything. And to this day, it is the same for me. I go back to Cambodia. And I see my father everywhere. I see him and, and everything that lives. It's hard, and I, I appreciate you talking about it because I, I know how difficult this, this has to be. Well, and, you know, as difficult as the questions are, I feel that it is, it is a continuing duty for me to speak about the story, to give voice to it every chance that I have. I know that a book that asks so much of a reader, I will have to give a lot of myself as well. You know, it was I who made the decision to write and to put it out there, and I'm all, I'm all right. Rami stops talking. Why? It was an act of not defeat, but retreat. Earlier we talked about being able to access this world of the dead and to go to this secret world to be safe. But what happens with Rami is this. She realizes that she has to live. 
she doesn't want to die and she wants to fight for every chance but she has to find a way to hide and the only safe place was one within herself and it began with her voice so it was an act of disappearing in order to retain the essential wholeness of who she is if i don't talk to them they can't belittle me they can't reduce me if i become mute they themselves become deaf they will not hear the things i dream about this is how rami a child would explain that act how do rami and her mother leave cambodia rami and her mother head for the refugee camp in thailand yes did you go to thailand yes we heard about the humanitarian workers there it was more or less rumors <laughs> but um we thought we might as well the vietnamese had come the the war was yes, over yes yeah, yes so beginning in late 1978 it was obvious that there was a war between vietnam and cambodia and bits and pieces of news filter through us to ordinary people there was no newspaper no television nothing this time the sound of gunfire gave us hope <laughs> and then the vietnamese all won and they came into the country and the khmer rouge retreated into the jungle and the villages took that the opportunities in that chaos when no one is really paying attention <laughs> if you're not from that particular village then you head back to your hometown wherever that is or if you're from the city you try to go back but the way my mother described that experience to me was from her side of it she said i saw one red flag come down and another went up and i knew this was not a place for us How long were you in the camps in Thailand? I think it was a year and then we went to the Philippines for preparation to come to the US. And did you go to Massachusetts? No, to Minnesota. Well, actually to Missouri, sorry. To Missouri first we were sponsored uh, by a Catholic organization to Missouri and we stayed there from 81 to 84 and then my mom had a friend um in Minnesota who was in the refugee camp with us but had left before and he said come to Minnesota it's a place with great schools and very nice people and of course we didn't know about that much snow <laughs> nobody does <laughs> yes <laughs> and but now i feel minnesota is is home what was the transition like i'm i'm assuming it was a little easier for you because you were younger yes. than for your mother but it can't have been easy it can't have been easy but after you went through something like the khmer rouge you're just so grateful for everything everything represented life uh, the buzz of a uh, fluorescent light in uh, the uh, baggage claim conveyor belt all these things was just vibrating supermarkets yes yeah, supermarkets you know everything there was just so much food and and i think uh, both the culture shock for both my mother and i came much later uh, for me even much later i think i only felt the culture shock when i was actually <laughs> in college when i was asked to articulate that experience of being an immigrant having to rebuild uh, my life from nothing and so forth because what we came from that was nothing we knew that nothingness <laughs> more profoundly in cambodia during the early years we were just so grateful and so busy trying to take advantage of everything that was offered to, to us. And what about when you returned to Cambodia? I can't imagine what that was like. For me returning to Cambodia, I had that feeling that I was turning to my family's grave except my family's grave was a country. And yet on the other hand, I I felt grateful that I was in a safe place now safe in the sense of I can escape Cambodia anytime I chose I had my American passport so 
I didn't have to stay. But because I had that luxury, I stayed for a long time. The first time was about two months to commune with the dead again, to face the losses, to discover the possibilities for moving forward. That first experience was very important in the sense of it connected me with the loss, the tragedy, but it also gave me a clear sense that I survived, that I was not among the dead as I had felt when I left that country as a child, but that I, I survived and I can take my life forward now and I, I can take those I loved with me. I don't have to just bury them here in this land. I can carry them with me. And is that when you began to come to the decision to write the book? Yeah, I think the first conscious decision that I want to write this story um, in, in the sense of a book form, a narrative that I can share with the world. I want the world to know what happened to the country, what happened to my family. But in the more intimate sense, I just want to be able to speak of it now. Well, you wrote a saga, but this is my note, is but on a very intimate scale with your family sort of representing what happened to the country as a whole. We see what happened to the country as a whole through the eyes of, of Rami. Yes, yes. And I had to make that uh, decision that it's the experience of a family, but I wanted to reflect uh, the, the experience of the whole country and yet I didn't want the reader to be lost in the history and the politics uh, of, of that time. I wanted to tell a story in a different way. I wanted the reader to travel with me, to, to trust this child. And I want to show that my country, Cambodia, my homeland, didn't start off as the killing fields. It was once a place of safety, a place filled with love. So I, I wanted the reader to discover that world and how it was transformed by war. Well, as we know, In the Shadow of the Banyan is chosen for the big read. And that means communities across the country are going to come together to read and talk about this book. What are your thoughts? What are your hopes for that? Well, first of all, Thank you so much to the Big Read Program for choosing Banyan. It is a huge honor, and I'm just so grateful to the, the readers in general and, and institutions like the NEA that have made such effort to give voice to this kind of small voices, in, in a sense, you know, works that may not have such a broad appeal right off, you know, but... Through the Big Read program, I think more and more people are hearing about it. I guess what I'm hoping for it is that a book like Banyan will continue to be part of the discourse of our American experience. And it is vitally important as our world gets smaller and smaller that even though the book is set in Cambodia, set in a particular time, it is part of a larger, more universal uh, human experience. And um, I hope that every reader who comes across it will not think of it as this is a Cambodian story, but will see their story, their life, their journey reflected somehow in this family's experience. And I hope this reflection of themselves that they see is about hope, about love, the unbreakable bonds of a family, and that no matter how much suffering there is in the world, especially these days, that humanity will always triumph. Okay, Vade, thank you so much. Thank you. That's Vade Ratner. She was talking about her novel, In the Shadow of the Banyan. In the Shadow of the Banyan is a 2016 Big Read title. To find out more about The Big Read, go to neabigread.org. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. <laughs>